Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the next interview. Ah, oh, hi. How are you doing? Thank you for joining me. And the next. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. I just wait. Well, no, we don't have to wait. Uh, l let me start right away. <laughs> Always. Always a bit nervous with these interviews, but we're going to do this. So, <laughs> today um, my guest is the co founder of the NGO Taste of Malawi and the founder of Pair Linked. And she is a really free-spirited, mission-driven, and wholehearted person. And she's also my boss. So um, I joined Taste of Malawi around three years ago, and that's where we've when we've met, and we've been working together ever since. And as I said in the introduction, in the caption that uh, she has kind of a nomadic lifestyle and what I mean with that is she moved around a lot like after high school she moved to Malawi she stayed there for two years that's when she founded the NGO T Taste of Malawi with um, Alexander Kumshesa together after the two years she moved back to Germany to the south of Germany and started her studies there. During her studies, she moved all around the world again to Costa Rica, even though her Spanish was not the best, but that did not really stop her, so she just stayed there and continued her studies. And after a year, she moved back to Germany to the other side <laughs> and continued and finished off her studies in Potsdam. Now she lives in Alicante in Spain and fulfilled herself a dream by living near the ocean and yeah she really shows you what it means to follow your heart and she also really follows her intuition and really really knows what it means to step out of her comfort zone so i'm super excited to get her on and yeah let me help her Oh god, what did I do? There we go. Hello. So Hello. <laughs> okay, wait. I had to yeah, now it's perfect. <laughs> the volume was a bit low. <laughs> okay, welcome, Jana. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Let's not start the interview right away. I think you know already that I'm always starting with some heavy questions. Yeah, what does it mean to you to be a woman? For you, what does it mean to be a woman? Um, for me, being a woman is much about empowering one another to be part of a group of inspiring people from different women who are inspiring one another, who are supporting one another. I feel, I feel like I'm part of a team, of a women's team. Um, that's for me, being a woman. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Yeah, indeed, we are a team. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm a team player. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> and uh, would you call yourself a feminist? Um, it, it depends the day. Um, actually, yes, I would call myself a feminist because I, I'm, I really want that everybody has equal rights. But I think I'm not this this feminist which you have in mind when you're talking about a feminist um, being on the street, going out, fighting for your rights. I I'm more like a feminist of living by example. Um, the way I live, the way I interact with other people, this is how I live my feminist life. Is um, yeah, life by example. But I'm not much of the person who's going on the street demonstrating every week and fighting for my rights. I'm more like, well, let's let's do some things. Let's live the feminist lifestyle, and that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like there's, I think there's so many ways of being a feminist. So there is no one way or another. It's just. How you show up in daily life is surely, surely an important part of it. Um, do you talk about it or publicly? Um, feminism or feminism? can you come again? Uh, would you say that you talk about it publicly, uh, being a feminist? Mm, I think in my Yeah, in my volunteer work, which I do with Taste of Malawi, which you introduced so well, um, yes, I do talk a lot about um, the different positions which women are holding because in Malawi, the life, being a woman also yeah, goes along with other problems like for me as a European woman. So they are, they are very much less privileged like I am. For example, yeah, I, I also can see injustice in my daily life, especially if I'm in a um, in, if I'm in a group with other men. Usually, as a young founder, men conceive other men like they're more they're more powerful founders, and I'm blonde, I'm nice, I'm always smiling. So people mistake it for being weak. Just because I'm a very happy and smiley person, which doesn't mean you cannot mistake it with being weak. It just is my personality on one hand, but it doesn't mean that I'm I'm not a good businesswoman. So usually, if I'm together with a man, they think, okay, look at this young blonde girl. Um, they can see the injustice, and. But on the other hand, I'm very much privileged because people give me a lot of trust because also the way I appear, definitely. I'm European, I'm German, I'm blonde, blue eyes. Um, so that's on one hand. And when I'm talking about the women I'm working with in Malawi, which actually are the same, the same way business women like I am, but maybe they have a black skin, maybe they have not the blonde hair and not the blue shiny eyes like I, I have. Um, they have to fight much more. So I think in this way, I have to talk about privileges, being a woman, not being a woman, and so many different setups in my life. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, is, that is totally true. And um, as we touched about case of Malawi, um, I want to go in there right now um tell us a little bit what actually is taste of malawi yeah for everybody who doesn't know it yet you should definitely look it up um because it's an amazing organization empowering young young students people who are starting with over their career in all over the world um who want to learn social entrepreneurship. And on the other hand, uh, we are working together with a group of women in Malawi in the East of Africa, uh, where these women want to learn how to yeah, become businesswomen, like I said, how to place their tailoring products, um, all of them their tailorices, and to sell them on the European market. And both groups, we have the same goal. We want to learn how you can be a social company how you can how you can trade um, 
how you can trade closers on a fair and sustainable way. So we came together to learn from one another, to support us in this learning process and to grow together. Yeah. That's what we yeah. do. And there, there you really see um, that Taste of Malawi is a organization that supports women. It's all about this female empowerment and women uh, yeah, supporting other women, helping each other, helping each other grow. And um, yeah, that, that I think is really unique about this technology. And um, how did you actually found it? How did it start, Taste of Malawi? Um, yeah, it's, I think a project almost never starts with, let's start a project. No, it wasn't like that. It was more like, well, um, I got to know amazing women in Malawi who knew how to tailor, but they, their self-esteem was very low. So actually when I went there and I asked them if they could tailor me some things, they didn't really know if they could, if the quality was what I was looking for. So um, they were a bit lost there. And I got to know the son of one of the tail races, who's the co-founder of the project, Alexander. And um, yeah, actually I said, well, we are friends. You can try it. It's your chance now to tailor something. And I can also support you in selling those products to other people and she tailored me amazing things and this is how it started um empowering this woman to really take a step and to try to tailor what she has learned she 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 was a tailorist it's, it's not that i taught her how to tailor i'm not a tailor um it was more about empowering her yes try it tailor and sell it to me you can do it you have you have everything you need for it because in Malawi, one important thing to know is that tailoring is more of a of a man job. It's not a typical women women job. So, um, so there it was pretty much needed to empower those women to take take their position on the market and to sell their products. Yeah, and they they're really doing. You see nowadays in Malawi a lot of. Uh, women, female designers and um, women who could pay their living with tailoring. And some of them indeed also went to our school, uh, which is really awesome. And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and the unique thing about the process as well is that it's not just the project funded by white person that there and help pity for others, <laughs> but it's actually a co founding um, with, like you said, Alexander Kumsese, he's the co founder and he is my Indian. Um, he was in the project 24 and um, yeah. He's in yeah, I think it's so important that we started it together. Um, because myself, of course, I've lived in Malawi for quite a lot, long time. For two years I was there, but still I'm not from there. I don't know what it means to be a Malawian woman. I don't know what it means to be a Malawian tailor. I'm not a tailor. I'm not a Malawian woman. I know what it means to be a German woman. Um, and of course, I also have my my ideas and my my benefits of joining this organization because I am part of this organization because I want to learn, I want to grow. And on the other side, we have the Malawian, Malawian team, the women there who also want to learn and to grow. So I think it's not just my motivation to make them grow as other organizations maybe have their objectives to make people grow. It's like we are more of a team, we came together we're united now to grow together and each one has their own motivation to go along with that and also their background and their knowledge which is coming in there yeah. yeah yeah we all have really quite unique background stories of course we <laughs> process uh, to work together um also digitally around the world uh, yeah yeah and what what do you think about 
equality of women, um, let's say in Malawi, because they that's where most people um, um, and compare Germany. Equality of women in Malawi in comparison to Germany. Hmm. I would say that um, from my perspective and from my point of view, I would say that I am as a woman in Malawi, people bring come up with much more trust towards me than they come than my my workmates, my friends from my project have. So when I tried to go to Malawi every two years to to visit and to, yeah, just to keep in touch and to work closer together. And I can see that I get much more done, but in a way of, for me, it's more easier to open doors, to, to meet important people, to meet politicians, to meet other organizations, because they see me and and they trust me which is great yeah. for me which i feel i feel very privileged i feel like wow that was easy i got to know the minister of health in malawi oh, that that was easy and on the other hand i go to my friends um who are working with me in the project which are malawi and ask them why didn't you never approach the minister of health he's so kind and they look at you like, yeah, we tried that, but they never answered. You're like, what? What they never answered? So now I'm there, and that's so easy. And you try, and you don't, you don't get along, or you don't get any appointment. And that's what happens a lot. And of course, from my side, I feel like, well, it's so important that I go to to work on those on those networks. But on the other hand, it creates so much pain. For my people, which I'm working with in Malawi, who are trying to open doors as well, for the two years I'm not around, for example, and then I'm there for some weeks and it goes so smooth. And that's not because I'm like, of course, I'm a good person and I'm friendly and so on. But I wouldn't say that because of the of the way I am. That's because all the people working there in Malawi, they're also very intelligent, very motivated and hardworking people. It's more because of my background, because of my privileges. And that's making me sad. And um, so I'm trying to help or I'm trying to, yeah, to, to give my voice or to use my voice in a way to open up the doors so that once the doors open, my fellow friends from the project, they can join in. And once they're in, they can make themselves a voice. So that's kind of how we work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's still a very difficult situation uh, for sure that we yeah. often have to face um, that uh, we can remain also the skin color. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. But tell me a little bit about you. Um, talking about born privileged position. So <laughs> tell me about it. Tell me about the background story. Yeah. As I already shared, I know I'm a privileged woman. <laughs> No, I, I, yes, I'm born and raised in Germany. Um, my, I have two younger sisters. I'm the oldest. Um, I was raised in a woman-led household. My mother, she is um, our carer, our, yeah, my guidance. Um, I have a very strong relationship with my mother. Yeah, and... Yeah, we were raised there together in the in the west western part of Germany, close to Düsseldorf. If somebody has been there, that's where I was raised. And yeah, we moved a lot. We don't have property um, because, on one hand, I come from a very basic middle class family. Um, my father got sick very early during my childhood and also passed away during my childhood. And so my mom, she was uh, working and taking care of us. And that's, I think it's the reason why we never had really a property. We kept on moving in different um, 
areas. It was, it's always the same region, Western Germany. It was always close to my grandparents, for example. But yeah, that's where I, I was raised. And I love moving ever since. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, you together from childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got it from there. My mom, she actually says that I got it from my father, who also traveled a lot. He um, was working on ships to do, um, like a technician, doing the ele electric work there on ships. So he was away for months. But I don't remember that much. Um, but yeah, that's what she said. So we all have this traveling spirit in my family. <laughs> yes. right. Apparently it passes from generation, generation to generation. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's <Yeah>. genetic. <laughs> and uh, tell me also a little bit about your mother, because uh, she has been influencing you a little bit. Yes, my mom, she is a very, very impressive woman. Um, I'm not sure when you asked me if I'm a feminist, I was asking myself, well, what would my mother say if I'm asking her if she's a feminist? Um, she, I'm not sure. I have to ask her next time I see her. But um, yeah, she has to let me know. And definitely, I, I should I, ask her if she, <laughs> if she sees herself as a feminist. But she had, you know, being a, a young, my mother's quite young, um, so being a young mother with three kids and a sick husband, she had to carry a lot of responsibility and also to fight for herself. Um, I have a good story. Once we had um, a technician coming to our house asking for, yeah, I wanted to connect it to the, to the new um, Wi-Fi. Can I speak to the man of the household? And she was looking at him like, okay, badly sad. You can go by. <laughs> like, you know, there's no man of the household. If you want to connect my Wi Fi, you have to you have to work with me. And that's not 20 years ago. I think it was like five years ago over there. It's like um, she was taking care of everybody, but she's also obvious. She's also a blonde woman, um, and she's also friendly. We're all very friendly, smiley people, um, very well-educated. So whenever you open the door and you see a woman smiling, they must take it for not being the man of the household, if you can say it, like, just to put it in that words. So she had to fight for that because she had to be the the woman of the household, meaning like taking over all the responsibility, taking care of the kids, taking care of their husband, taking, you know, which was almost like another kid um, and, and fighting there while people they couldn't see that she had all the responsibility because yeah, sometimes you can't, you can't see it. So she's a very impressive woman fighting a lot for her children's rights, fighting for what she needs, what is important for her, fighting for others. I think in my family, we also have a lot of sense for injustice, but maybe it's not just my family. I think everybody has it. If you see injustice, it hurts. And she is somebody who speaks up when she sees injustice and try to, first, I think she tried, she learned how important it is to protect her children. But I think also a very important learning was that she had to learn how to protect herself. And that's also what she did. And she, she learned to say, okay, people, I know I have to take care of my family, my kids, my husband, but I also have to take care of myself because if I'm not okay, I cannot take care of anybody here. And there she needed to learn how to, yeah, to speak out, to tell her needs and her yeah, what pains her, what her wishes. And so that was an important learning. But once she made it, she always told us that it's so important. You can't just take care of others if you also take care of yourself. Yeah, and yeah. that's... But never stop smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and you never stop smiling. <laughs> Okay, we are going down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> yeah, yeah. 
um, usually <laughs> see the influence of your mother and how they really want to support. Um, yeah. It's um, a pain that she doesn't have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and mother also they they you know, wings to fly, and I think she gave you wings to fly as well because you flew out of the house when you were nineteen, <laughs> you moved to Malawi, and yeah, uh, we talked about this already. We funded the Taste of Malawi with Alex there, and then you came back. And you wanted to study. Yes, I wanted to study. Um, I'm. I, I always was a very much of a. Or I'm still. I'm a career woman. I like to to work. I also like to work on things which I feel like they are moving society. Um, I love taking over responsibility. I love thinking strategically. I love making plans, developing things. All those I think I really, really love. They they motivate me. They really they touch me. So when I was younger, before I went to Malawi, I thought that become becoming a, a like studying chemistry would be the perfect choice of my life because there you have a lot of career um, perspectives. You can really grow. You can become famous and you can move the world. And I love natural sciences. So before I went to Malawi, I was so sure that I would start at Bayer or I don't know to <laughs> to make a career. I also did a lot of internships there to. Yeah, to you know, to get to know where I'm gonna work later on, and then I went to Malawi, and I felt like, wow, moving society is so much fun. Working with people, working, yeah, getting engaged with politics, and it touches you. If you go abroad for two years, it really makes something with you. So when I came back, I was like, well, I have to, I still want to do, I want to have a career. I want to do, I want to study natural sciences, but I cannot leave alone this part of politics of, um, of all, all those things which touch me. I want to move things. And so I decided the best studies for me are geography. So I went to the south of Germany because there are there's a lot of sun. I like the sun, so I went to Freiburg to study geography here, there, and it was the best decision ever because the city is beautiful, lovely. The studies are amazing, and I was super happy with that choice. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a such an amazing thing to say. Okay, I'm going to study. Where the sun is shining, <laughs> I don't deal with bad weather. <laughs> I definitely don't like rain. <laughs> yeah, so yeah I'm the club, and here I am in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I completely get it. <laughs> Something didn't work out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just follow the sun. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you, you did follow the sun actually, because um, you went to Costa Rica. Yes, I went for a semester abroad in Costa Rica, actually with the hope that um, this country is very small, and I, I had the hope that I could live close to the sea or to the ocean. Uh, but I didn't. I lived up the mountain in the capital city, which is quite far from from the sea but it was an amazing time the university of costa rica is, or um, like talking for the ge geography part there is amazing i learned a lot i got to know people i learned spanish as well that's also an amazing thing <laughs> and um yeah so there i lived for half a year and um, yeah, I was excited to get to know Latin America because I had a lot of, or I have a lot of friends who have been there, who have talked about it. You don't meet too many people who have been to Africa. So usually it was like everybody talking about a Latin America and I was there, yeah, I've been to Africa. I have no idea about Latin America. Everybody calls it like a group develop, developing countries, like it would be the same, but I couldn't believe that. 
So I went to Latin America or to Central America, to Costa Rica to see um, how it is, how life is there. And I really enjoyed it. It's a wonderful country. You've also been there, so you know. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really great. Yeah. yeah. And the university actually is really beautiful. I, I also visited it when I was there. And uh, yeah, oh, there came a question. Did you travel in Latin America as well? Yes, I did. I did travel in Latin America. I, yeah, I, um, I had, usually I planned my studies well. So I had Fridays and Mondays off. So I could, during my studies, I could travel within Costa Rica, which is amazing because all the buses are leaving from the capital. So if you're living in the capital, it's very easy to travel around Costa Rica. So if you're planning on going to Costa Rica, uh, have that in mind. You always crawl the capital wherever you go. So for weekend trips, I could explore the... I could, I could explore the country itself. So once my studies were over, I had time to go to Panama And later on, I also went to the north to uh, Nicaragua and Guatemala. I couldn't go to Honduras or El Salvador because during that time it was really unstable. But I was lucky that I could go to Nicaragua because just when I went, when I came back, the the situation was a bit more difficult. But while I was there, it was really peaceful and quiet. It was really nice. So yeah. and I really liked it. And just last year, I went to Colombia to travel again there because I really, I like it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful continent. Um, I've, I've been the same route as you have been. And um, it's also really uh, fascinating to see the differences, especially between Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua. Like when I mm -hmm. entered Nicaragua the first time, I felt like back home in Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> That was my <laughs> so, it's uh, su super different <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It was good that I could travel a bit because, yeah, each country is so different. But on the other hand, I'm really a slow traveler. I love traveling slowly, um, and I got tired. Um, it was my fr I was away for six months, which like three and a half, four months were part of my studies. So actually I was just traveling for two months in in this in the region there. And later on I really wanted to go home because I I don't get along with with the discussions about how many countries have you visited? Um yeah I don't feel it. I I, I, I love each country has their special special things, they're hard, the people there are amazing. So also some people, they ask you, which country do you like best in Latin America? It's like, people, we're talking about homes of people. How can you say, which country do you like best? I don't like it at all. Like, I don't like any country better than the other. Each one, each country is a home. Each country is where people live. Each, each country has their problems. Each country has their benefits. They have good foods and bad foods. All over. I've seen it in Germany, in Spain, in, in Latin America, in Africa. It's like you you kind of talk like that about homes. <laughs> so I like I like this. after now all the countries I've visited, they are wonderful. I feel very much connected, and um, I don't want to just rush through them to visit the hot spots. I want to be there. I want to meet the good sides and the bad sides, and appreciate that it's a home. <laughs> That is such a beautiful view that I, I've never heard that before. That that is incredible. I <laughs> yeah. That is, I I never I traveling myself. I never thought about that actually. But um, yeah. <laughs> Take it home. <laughs> And once you're in a hostel, meeting people who are showing you their yeah. passports, how many, how many stamps they have already. Yeah. Ask them if they have found a home in each one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, to I totally get it. I totally get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. And um, so you were six months in Costa Rica. 
Yeah, like, yes, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so, mm-hmm. we returned to Germany and yeah. moved to Potsdam. Exactly. I came back. I still had uh, like one semester at my home university to finish up some courses which were left um, to close up my studies. And I wanted to do my um, my thesis, my bachelor thesis in a research institute. And so I went to Potsdam to the north of Germany just because there there's a research institute and you from many papers. So I was curious to get to know them. So I went to the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change to do my my bachelor thesis about climate change and um and food safety. And yeah, so I was writing my thesis there which was great and it was um yeah, where I got to know um my my now partner is also a bit motivation why I came to Spain to live here and it's also the place where I closed up my studies. <laughs> yeah, and now you're writing your masters. <laughs> yes, now I'm on my master thesis. <laughs> Always writing. <laughs> Before you started writing your masters when the coronavirus hit you decided oh let's just found another company. <laughs> What was the thought about family? <laughs> Actually, it started before Corona. Um, before Corona, I yeah, actually, it started before Corona. It just came in time. Um, I was lucky, really. Um, I was thinking on on well, I could at at the, at the NGO Taste of Malawi. We are working only digitally. It's the only way we can work because I love traveling. I, like for me, having an NGO office, it's, it's impossible. Like I'm every six months in a different place. So also from my point of view, it's impossible for having a classical NGO, which is working from one place, but also the people I'm working with. They're all those kind of traveling people who love to get around to, they cannot say, okay, I'm committing myself to an NGO now, which is based in somewhere. It's impossible because all, all our members, they, would need to change the NGO every six months or even even shorter. So so we started to work virtually since the beginning. It was the first thing what we did. And we have never changed that. We are just having this digital meetings, the digital lifestyle, the digital way of working. And I never thought about it of being special because it just was the thing what made sense to us, the only thing how we could work together. But we got a lot of skills during the time. And also for me to to lead and to accompany this team made me grow as a digital leader, as a digital team leader. And then at the end of last year, I felt like, wow, a lot of NGOs, they have problems with it. And some NGOs, they also approached me and asking, How do you do that? You're such a young team. You always have new volunteers, people asking you if they can join. And we have so many problems of finding young people. It's like, how can you have problems? We have so many who want to join. And we have so many motivated people who stay, who stay for many years. Like all the team members of Taste of Malawi, they're really... We have only a few members who stay like half a year or a year. Usually we have members who have been there for six years already, like since the beginning. And so I felt like, well, maybe I have to give some of the experiences I made. And I started with a webinar um, teaching other NGOs on how you can run a digital team, what you can learn. And then Corona started and everybody had to learn how does it work? How do you work digitally? Like, how do you have to get along with that? And I got so many messages, people asking me if I could give another webinar, if I could give a training, a coaching, and other things. So so I decided to, well, then I, I, I should offer it. I registered it. And now I'm trying to be, a, yeah, on a mission of digital digitalizing the NGO world of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> 
And that is a hard thing. Let me tell you something about <laughs> Germans. We are also afraid. Yeah, we don't trust the internet. We don't generally trust nothing that is going on on the internet. So, <laughs> So there's so many, well, there's so many in Joe's interest that actually I got a lot of messages, many also from the older generation, people from all, all over the ages want to learn how does it work. Um, and it's something you have to learn because we, we all grew up with an offline lifestyle. We know how to make friends offline. We know how to work as a team offline. Everybody of us, we learned it from kindergarten, what our parents taught us. But I can, I have a younger sister, like one of those two I have, but the youngest one, she is turning 19, oh, she turned 19. And she grew up in a different way. For her, she knows how to make friends online. She knows how to work online. She, for her, it's so natural. And she's 19. There are people now, there are younger kids coming who are maybe are now six or they are children who are three. They know already how to, how to get on YouTube to their favorite, to their favorite, um, favorite series. And they, they get there before they even know how to write. And just admit, of course, they know already how to work as a team digitally. They know how to connect with people digitally. Their kids now having classes online from primary school. All those, they come with a lot of knowledge. And if we want those people to have, to find their way in volunteer service, because I'm not a person who believes that younger people are not politically interested. That's a lie. Younger people, they really want to, they're motivated. They want to, they want to be part of the society. They want to form society. But if you want to work together, We have to open our ways to integrate those younger generations into our NGOs. And that's the reason why we have to offer those digital ways of working together so that we can also open up our doors for younger people. Yeah. 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 Change happening. It changed. And maybe my trainings in 20 years of now, they're not needed anymore because um, those, those, yeah, because the younger generation, they learn it naturally. They grow up with it. They learn those skills the way we learned how to form a team now. I, I never did a course in, in how do I make a group work a, at school. I was taught from my teachers. I grew up like that. I learned it in kindergarten. So I think it's the same way students learn it now with digital work. But for all the rest of us who haven't been, <laughs> who didn't grow up with it, I think we learn. We need to learn it. It's just the skill set. Yeah. And we are also still around for around for about twenty yeah. years now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's definitely a change. But I mean, um, also when I entered the working world, um, I had trainings in team leadership. Um, on how to lead because you don't know that naturally. So it doesn't mm -hmm. matter really if it's digital or non-digital. Um, you need the training in how to do the team properly. And um, so actually that probably will never go out of style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So... Um, What motivates you? Do you have any role models you look up to, female role models? Hmm, what are my role models? I don't have one particular person. Um, I like, I think I, like from all my friends, I have the things I like about them, which I take as a role model. Like, I think from each friend, you, you find things which impress which I'm impressive, which I try to, to achieve. Um, yeah, but I don't have like a particular person. Um, but I'm also not looking at stars. I'm more of like, I more look at my friends, my family, um, people who, are, who impress me. Yeah, 
Yeah, that is wonderful because that's also like the sense of these interviews um, to show that the people around <laughs> you have amazing stories to tell. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Showing yeah. stories, uh, yeah. And to find new role models in the coming Sundays. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And if you could leave a message to all the women in the world, what would it be? Leave a message on all the women in the world. Definitely to live community. As I, I think that makes it round here because as I said in the beginning, I feel like I'm part of the team woman and being as a feminist. So I think we should help each what each one from us we should ha help each other to yeah a bit like the the words of your channel as well your instagram uh, channel yeah it's like we have to help one another to to rise we have to help one another in our way and not yeah and to support because life is hard enough and there's enough space for everybody there's no need to push away and to to find your way like there's the the earth is big enough for each one of us and each one of us has the gift the potentials which you can live so to live in harmony and to live together uh, to achieve your your wishes and what you need in life not what others are telling you you need but what you need is the thing which i'm wishing for how i want to live and how i believe we can live all together peacefully <laughs> yeah that's such a beautiful message and um I'm very sure everybody who sees this wants to follow you and wants to know about more uh wants to know more about you thank <laughs> 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 you so much everybody thank you <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, I'm very happy to for each follower or for each um, message. I'm yes, you have my channel here at Fairlink uh, Digitale Teens, which is mainly a German speaking channel, but for English speakers, my personal channel, I will leave it in the comments or um, I think it was also in the announcement. And if you are interested in this amazing project, Taste of Malawi, um, to work with amazing women, then you're most welcome also to join us there and to learn together with us how we can rise together. <laughs> yes, and I will also link everything in the description of this video. So you can just go there and stalk her and find everything out <laughs> that you want to know and get inspired. Thank you. It was such an inspirational interview. Um, I really, really enjoyed the time and thank you so much for coming on. Thanks a lot, Anna. It was a really nice time. And thank you also for this active community, asking questions in the comments, being there all the time. I have seen a lot of hearts. It was great. It was a lot of fun. So each one, all of you, thanks a lot for making it so great and have a wonderful evening. Yeah, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Bye. Bye.